Hello everyone and welcome to another Mate Nason video. In this video we're going to be learning how to play the one to four player game PAX Renaissance designed by Phil and Matt Eklund. This game originally came out in 2016 from Sierra Madre Games. However, it's been re-released via Kickstarter and a joint publishing with Ion Game Designs. In PAX Renaissance, you will play as a banker, funding different kingdoms and their kings in different wars, crusades, and even conspiracies and civil wars. All of this is in hopes of claiming one of four different victory conditions. You will have to be clever to outwit your opponents in order to achieve these objectives before they can. So let's go to the table and learn how to set up the game. To set up a game of Pax Renaissance, set the board in the middle of the table. Then give each player one of four different starting bankers. There are no special abilities between them, just deal them out. We'll be setting up a four player game as the purple player. Then each player will take their matching colors pawns known as concessions and set them in their supply. Choose a random player to be the start player and give that player three florins. The second player will receive four, the third player will receive five, and the fourth player will receive six. Then each player will take one of their starting concessions and place it on the map in the positions indicated. The purple starting concession will go here, the yellow starting concession will go here, the green starting concession will go here, and the blue starting concession will go here. Now you should prepare the east and west starting market decks. Take each deck and count out 12 cards and set them aside, and then from the remaining cards count out four more cards for each additional player. So in a four player game that would be 12 more cards. From the first 12 cards that you counted out, add the two Comet cards matching that deck's color and shuffle them into the deck. Then take the cards you counted out four of for each player, shuffle them, and add that on top of the first stack of 12, de of 12 cards, including the Comet cards. Return the rest of the cards to the supply. Do the same for the East deck. Now populate the market with the cards from the deck. The first card on the far left is the trade fair cards. Both of these cards will be turned face down. Now take the blocked trade route discs and block the two east and the two west trade routes that do not start the game open. The only trade routes that begin the game are the east trade route and the white trade route in Byzantium. Take the discs and block the other trade routes with their correct color disc, like so. Now it is time to populate the rest of the map with the ruling class pieces. Each kingdom location has a capital which is denoted with all capital letters. Take the ruling class piece indicated in its color and fill in these cities. For example, Tana will get a Islam piece knight in this blue-green color, and Buddha in the Hungary Empire will receive a Catholic knight in the brown color. Do this for the rest of the map. Constantinople in the Ottoman Empire is special. It starts the game with one Islam rook and two Islamic knights. Be sure to populate Constantinople with all three pieces. Take the remainder of all the pieces and create supplies by the side of the board, including supplies of your floor and money. Now take the kingdom cards and deal them out to each of the indicated kingdoms. Now take the four victory cards, being sure they're on their inactive side, and deal them out to the victory conditions on the left side of the board. Now the game is set up and ready to play. 
In Pax Renaissance, players will take turns performing two different actions of six possible choices. These actions will help you gain money, influence kingdoms, and gain republics. The whole idea is to try to complete one of four different objectives. Perhaps you will have the most kingdoms. Perhaps you will have the most republics. Perhaps you will be a monopoly over global trade. Or maybe you will have the highest prestige in one of the most supreme religions in the Renaissance. Whichever objective you go after, the other players will be trying to stop you or race you to those objectives. So let's go to the table and learn how to play. All right, here we have a game of Pax Renaissance set up for four players. Before we begin talking about all the different actions you'll be able to do on your turn, it's probably a good idea to understand how you would win the game. In a game of Pax Renaissance, the game is played until one player can claim one of four different objectives, or victory conditions. At the start of the game, the four objectives, or victory conditions, are laid in their inactive position on the left side of the board. So let's take a look at these and see how you would win the game. As said, each victory condition starts the game as inactive, which means you can't claim this victory condition and win the game. However, throughout the game, players will have the option to purchase Comet cards from the market. These Comet cards allow you to choose one victory condition that is inactive and flip it over to its active side. Once a victory condition is on its active side, any player can spend an action to claim this objective if they meet its requirements and immediately win the game. So let's look at each of these objectives in detail so you kind of can have an idea of what you'll be trying to accomplish to win the game. The first one we're going to look at is the Imperial Victory, which is in the Age of Feudalism. This victory condition is pretty simple to understand. You just need to control two more king cards than each other opponent. Throughout the game, players will be doing actions that will allow them to gain kingdom cards. If you can have two more than each of your opponents of these kingdom cards, you can claim this victory condition if it's active and win the game. The next objective we'll talk about is very similar, and that is the Renaissance victory condition in the medieval age. This victory condition requires you to have more republics than each of your opponent, as well as have two more law prestige than any of your opponents. So when you gain these kingdom cards, different actions and effects in the game will allow you to change them from kingdoms to republics. If you can do that and gain more republics than all your opponents, the only other thing you have left to do is make sure you buy law prestige cards from the market. Have two or more of these than each of your opponents and more republics than each of your opponents, and you can win the game if this objective is active. The third victory condition to win the game is the globalization victory in the Galley Age. This one requires you to have two or more concessions than each opponent, as well as more discovery prestige than each opponent. Throughout the game, different actions you take will allow you to place pawns on the board known as concessions. These pawns are placed in between two different empire spaces on the map. If you can get two more of your pawns out on the board, more than your opponents, as well as purchase cards from the market, that have discovery prestige into your personal tableau, you can claim this victory condition if it's active in order to win the game. The last victory condition to talk about is the holy victory in the East-West Schism. This victory condition simply says to have the most prestige in the supreme religion. So we have been talking about prestige and each religion also has prestige on its cards too such as Islam, Catholicism, and Reformist. So you need to purchase the prestige in whichever religion is supreme and have more of that than your opponents. So now the question is, what will make one of these three religions the supreme religion? Well, there are two things to check for when trying to find a supreme religion. The first is that the religion must have more bishops in play than any other religion. Bishops are an agent that certain cards will have you put out 
And bishops always get put onto play on certain cards when the card is played. And so that religion must have the most bishops over all the other religions. That's the first step to be supreme. The second thing you need to check for to be supreme is to look at the map, specifically looking at theocracies. At the start of the game, there are only two theocracies in play. There is the Islamic theocracy in Malmuk, and there is the Catholicism theocracy in the Papal States, which those are printed directly on the map to remind you that these two kingdoms start off as theocracies. In order to be a supreme religion, you have to have more of your units in theocracies than any other religion. So here we see one Catholic unit, and we see one Islamic unit. One and one is not bigger than each other, so neither of these religions is supreme on the map. However, if we were able to add another Islamic knight in this uh, kingdom, for example, we now have two Islamic units and only one Catholic unit. And so now, Islam is supreme on the map, and as long as they have more bishops on cards than anyone else, they would be considered the supreme religion, which means a player could claim this victory as long as they have the most Islamic prestige in their tableau. Now that we have looked at the four different ways players can win the game through these objectives, there is one other victory condition that is not laid out on the board, and that is what happens if nobody wins by the time the game is over. The game does have an internal clock, which is counted by these market decks. If both of these market decks, the East and the West, are ever depleted, and you cannot refill any cards in the market, the game immediately ends. In that case, the winner is the player who has the most patronage prestige in their tableaus. Now that we understand the four different victory conditions that you can win, or what happens if the game runs out of time, let's look at all the different actions you'll be taking on your turn. Every player is going to be given a player board, and on that player board it will list the six possible actions you can take on your turn. Every player's turn will consist of two actions chosen from these six. There are three on the left and three on the right. So let's go through them one by one. The first action is purchase. This action simply allows you to buy a card from the marketplace. In a game of Pax Renaissance, there will be several cards face up on the market and you can purchase any of those cards. The cost of those cards is a number of florin depending on how many cards precedes it. For example, if you wanted to purchase this card here, you would need to pay one, two, three florin to the three cards preceding it, and then you will be able to take this card and add it immediately to your hand. If you want to purchase another card, you are allowed to do so, in which case you will then take your florins and add them to the board. Let's say you want to purchase this card now. You would then go one, two, three, but because this card is empty, you will pay the florin to that card to the one opposite of it, and now you can purchase this card and add it into your hand. The only other restrictions on purchasing cards is you can never have a hand of more than two cards. So if your hand is full, you're not allowed to purchase any cards. You're also not allowed to purchase any cards that you put money on this turn. So if you wanted to buy this card and this card, you would need to buy this one first, then this one, because you can't buy cards that you already put money on. The next action to talk about is play. This is how you actually play cards from your hand into your tableau. Playing cards from your hand in your tableau has no additional cost. All you do is select one of the cards in your hand and play it either in the west side if it is a west card or play it in the east side if it is east card. Any future cards you play will keep being added to that tableau, building it out as you go. That's all the cost is to play. However, it is important to note that when you do play a card, you are required to choose if you will do the card's special ability called a one-shot or not. This one-shot must be decided on when the card is played if you are going to use it. 
Many one-shots will also give you the ability to place agents. You have a choice. If you choose to do the one-shot, you are required to place the agent as well. If you choose not to do the one-shot, then placing the agent is optional. But you must make this choice at the time you play the card. We'll talk more later about exactly how one-shots work, but it's important to note that this is the time you would make that decision when the cards are added into your tableau. The next action to talk about is the sell action. This allows you to sell a card and gain two florins. You can sell any card that is in your tableau, either first card you played or the most recent card you played. You're also allowed to sell any cards from your hand. All you do is discard the card from the game and receive two florins to your personal banking supply. There are a couple considerations when discarding cards. The first is you are allowed to discard any king cards you received. If this card is in your tableau, you may choose to discard it to gain two florins. However, if that king is married to a queen, you have to discard both cards together. These cards will be returned to the main board, which is known as the throne. However, this action will net you four florins because even though it's a single action, you are getting rid of two cards. Another consideration is anytime you discard a card that has any units on it, such as bishops that might be on certain cards, the bishop will be removed from the game and added back into the supply. A lot of times, kingdom cards will have what are called repressed units on them. If you ever discard a kingdom card to gain two florins, those repressed units will go with it back to its throne on the board. So you'll take those with the king. It's also important to note that sometimes kingdom cards will subdue other kingdom cards, making a vassal relationship. You can sell vassals back for $2. However, if you sell the empire card that has the vassals, they're all returned back with them. However, you don't get any additional money for the returning vassals. All these actions we've talked about so far, purchase, play, and sell, the three on the left can be taken as many times as you want on your turn, two actions per turn. So you could purchase twice, play twice, or sell twice if you'd like. Now we're going to talk about the three actions on the right. These three actions can only be performed one time each turn. So if you choose to do a table ops, you can't do another table ops for your second action. However, you would be allowed to do one tableau ops and one trade fair. You just can't ever double dip in these three actions on the right. The first action to talk about is the tableau ops. The tableau ops very simply activates all the powers on either your west tableau or your east tableau. Your choice. Many of the cards will have what are known as operations on them. Those are signified by these color ovals that appear in the bands of the card. Each one of these operations will do a special effect either in tableaus or on the map. When you do a tableau ops, you can do one operation on each card in the tableau that you choose. So if a card has two or more operations, you can only choose one of them. You can perform these operations in any order. You could do an operation from this card, then an operation from this card, or vice versa. Again, we will talk later on about specifically what these operations do, but for now, understand that you do have the option on your turn to activate every card either in the east or the west of your tableau. The second uh, action you can do on the right side of your player board is Trade Fair. As the game progresses, you'll notice that money will start building up in the marketplace on the far left card known as the trade fair card. On your turn, you can start a trade fair. What happens is first, you get $1 from the bank added to your personal supply. This is the profits. Then, you will take all of the money off of the trade fair card and discard it from the game. Then you'll take this money and follow along the trade fair route on the map. Taking a look at the map at the start of the game, there are two starting locations for trade fairs, Trizabond and Tana. 
the black route, which goes to the east, and the white route, which goes to the west. Depending on which card you took the money from dictates which route you have to go along. What you do is follow along on the route, paying money to any pawn pieces, known as concessions, that are placed on the route in between two kingdoms. So in this case, as we go along, the purple player would get one dollar. And then we follow along the route, paying it to any additional pawns or concessions we run across. If you ever are going along the route and run across a pirate ship, you have to pay one of those dollars to the bank. And then you continue along the route. If at any point in time you run out of money, the trade fair immediately ends and the action is over. If you make it all the way through the route, following the line across, and get to the ending position of the trade fair, signified by this arrow, if there's still money left, then that money is added back to the trade fair card uh, to be saved for a later trade fair round. In addition to paying out profits for the trade fair, you must put out what are known as levies. Levies are placed in each kingdom that the trade fair went through, as long as there is room for it. So if we started in Trizabond here, the white trade fair place, we would have to add one of these units to the game board. Player's choice of which one they add. This unit must match the color and type of the city you choose to add it in. Then, if the trade fair continued on the route and passed through this card of Hungary, you would have to add a levy if there's room for one in the city. Continuing on, so on and so forth. If an empire is ever saturated and is full of units, then you just skip this phase and don't add a levy to that specific. After a player has taken both of their actions, don't forget to refresh the market board by sliding all cards over to the left and refilling the empty places. Don't forget if a card was taken for the trade fair, the card in its new left position will be flipped face down with any florins on it added to the top of the card to be used during a next trade action. So the first thing we will start talking about are the different one-shots that appear on the bottom of the cards that you must decide if you're going to enact them at the time you play them. There are a total of six one-shots, and luckily the game comes with a very nice player aid that goes through each of the one-shots and discusses how you will enact them. But let's look at them each one by one. The first one-shot we'll take a look at is the trade shift one-shot. This one-shot very simply changes the starting location of the trade fair action. At the beginning of the game, the east and the west trade fairs will both start up in Byzantium. However, if a player enacts this one-shot, the trade shift will start now in Timbuktu for the east. Again, you can tell it's east because of the black rib ribbon, and also Timbuktu has a black circle around it. To enact a trade shift, you very simply remove what's known as the broken disc from the new starting location and place the broken disc on the old starting location. Any units that were on that city are immediately repressed for free. And remember, repressed units are added to the kingdom card that they came from. Even if this kingdom card is still in its throne or in a player's tableau, you will place the repressed unit onto it. It's also important to remember, when you do a one-shot, you are required to place the agent that the card shows in the kingdom that the card shows. So this card will require us to play an Islamic Rook in the kingdom of Aragorn. So we will take our Islamic Rook here, and we will add it to one of these two cities. It's important to note that it does not matter if the unit symbol matches the city or not, when the card tells you to play it, you can just put it in any open position. If there were no open positions, you can repress the unit that's there by paying one florin to the bank and taking the repressed unit to the kingdom and replacing it with your unit. One last thing to mention quickly about trade routes is there is one trade route known as the Spice Island trade shift 
that requires you to already have in your Tableau a discovery icon prestige. You cannot take this one shot to switch the Spice Island trade shift unless you have that icon. But moving on to the next one shot, we have the coronation. The coronation appears on queen cards and it allows them to marry the king of one of their different suitor options. Most coronations have three different options. The main rule for choosing this one shot is the king that the queen will marry must still be on his throne. You cannot marry the queen off to a king that is already in someone's tableau, even your own. So we see we have three choices here. If you decide to choose one of them, you will place the cards together and set them down in your tableau, and they are now married. This is a nice, easy way to gain a kingdom card. We already talked about when you sell these cards together, they go together, or if the card ever suffers a regime change, the king is violently killed, and so is his queen, in which case you will discard her card. More on that stuff later. The next action to talk about is the Opesty. The Opesty action, or one shot, checks everyone's tableau to see if they have both religions available in their tableau, or represented. If any players have both of these religions in their tableau, they must discard all cards from their tableau with that religion. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have a tableau that has one Catholic, Catholicism prestige, another Catholic prestige, one reformist prestige, and one reformist prestige. So if someone had played this card that says, check to see if anyone has both reformist and Islamic, this card would not trigger any of these because both Islam and reformist are not present. However, let's pretend the player did have one Islamic prestige as well. Well, now they have at least one of each. So all cards they have that match both of those religions will be discarded and removed from play. The player who played the apostasy card is not free from its own effects. So if this player had played this apostasy card, they would also have discarded all of those cards that match the reformist religion or the Islamic religion. So it will trigger itself. However, it's important to note you will still be allowed to play any of the agents that are on the card, even though the card will be discarded. When placing Islamic bishops, or any bishops, the bishop must go on a card that matches the kingdom the card was played. In this case, it just says the East. So this bishop can go onto this card, or if any other player had a card in their tableau that was also an Easterly card, you could instead send the bishop to an opponent's tableau as long as the kingdoms matched. In this case, any Easterly kingdom, so this player could choose their own card or anyone else's card from an Eastern kingdom. Important note about bishops, when a bishop is on top of a card, that card is suppressed. This means that the actions or operations on the card will not work, with the exception of blue religious actions. So if this bishop was on this card, the only action or operation this card could do is this blue inquisitor action. The player could not ever choose to take the tax action because the bishop is suppressing it. Also important, if a bishop is ever added to a card that already has a bishop, even if they are the same religion, the bishops will immediately kill each other and be taken back to the supply. It's also important to note that if a bishop is ever placed on a kingdom card that has repressed units on it, you may choose to kill one of the repressed units. So in this case, if the bishop went to this easterly kingdom, we could kill this repressed knight if we so desired. The next three one-shots all have to deal with having combat on the board. There are two cards known as Civil Wars 
and three cards known as religious wars. Let's take a look at the two civil wars. The first civil war is known as a conspiracy. This attack basically has all agents on the outside of a kingdom attacking all agents on the inside of a kingdom. Let's take a look at how it works. The first thing that happens during an attack of any kind is you must look at the agents attacking. This card is going to give us an agent of a Christian uh, rook. So we will take that Christian rook and I like to place it right next to the name of the kingdom. And we are having a conspiracy in the Papal States. So here we have the Papal States, so I like to set it right next to the word of the kingdom. So now we must define our attackers and our defenders. Our attackers are known on our cheat sheet here. It lists every one of these combats and talks about the attackers, defenders, what happens when you win, what happens if it's your own kingdom, or someone else's. Attackers are the agents we placed, in this case a Christian rook, any pirates that are bordering the kingdom, even if they are from a different religion. So this pirate will also be considered an attacker, and any repressed knights or rooks on the kingdom card. Again, it doesn't matter if this kingdom card is still in its throne or in someone's tableau, any repressed knights or rooks will be able to participate in this attack. So we have an attack strength of one, two, three. The defenders will be knights and rooks inside the kingdom, regardless of color. And that is just one Christian rook. So we will now deal damage, which is just a one-for-one -one exchange. So our Christian rook will be killed inside the papal state. And then we must take one damage on the outside, and we'll choose to get rid of this pirate here. And now we will get our victory because we have at least one unit of attackers remaining. As long as one attacker survives, they are considered victorious. The victory allows you to take any agents that the card gave you and place them directly into the kingdom as long as there's space for them. You are also allowed to take any repressed knights or rooks and add them to the kingdom if you wish. However, this kingdom is saturated on the map. There is no more room for any knights and rooks, so we will keep this Christian knight repressed on the kingdom card. We are then allowed to also free any repressed pawns that might be here, but there are none, so we'll skip that step. And lastly, we are allowed to place a bonus concession. So we're playing as the purple player, so we are allowed to add one of our pawns. Again, we could place the pawn right here for free, to get some trade profit the next time someone does a trade phase. Or we could choose to place our pawn here and repress the yellow player. And that, of course, would cost us one florin from the bank to do so. But I don't think we'll do that. Instead, we will just place our purple pawn right over here to get some of those trade profits. The other bonus that you get for a victory is you get to take this kingdom card to your own tableau. If this kingdom card is in its throne, add it to your tableau. If it is in an opponent's tableau, steal it from them and add it to your tableau. If it is in your own tableau, you will change it from a kingdom to a republic. And this is one of the ways that you can actually upgrade your kingdom cards to republics. Even if this is a republic in someone else's tableau, you will still take it and you revert it back to a king when it enters your tableau. It is only if it starts in your tableau as a king that you would upgrade it to a republic. Another thing to note about gaining kingdom cards is if the king had any queens with him. If they were both together in the throne, you will take the king and the queen as a pair along with any repressed units that might be on them, including bishops that could be on the card. You'll take everything with you to your tableau. If the king and the queen were in a, another player's tableau, you will only get the king. The queen will die in the process of the regime change, and you will only take the king. You will, of course, get to keep any repressed units that might be on the king's card 
However, bishops that were on that card in another player's tableau will die in the process of coming over to your tableau. The last thing to mention is sometimes kingdoms will have vassals under them that they have conquered. If you ever gain a kingdom in a regime change, you do not get the vassals under it. You will only get the main kingdom. However, all of the vassals that were under them in your opponent's tableau will be discarded and liberated being returned to the main board. That is a good way to remove kingdoms from your enemy's tableau. Moving on, the next Civil War one-shot is known as the Peasant Revolt. This Civil War has the peasants rise up against its empire. Let's take a look how that works in the Ottoman Empire. The first thing, of course, that happens with any combat or any one-shot is you must um, get the agent ready. In this case, we have a pawn, and we're playing as the purple player, so we will add the pawn as one of the attackers in the Ottoman Empire. Again, I like to just place the pawn on the name of the empire because it's not technically on the map and it's not repressed. Now, let's look at how a Peasant Revolt Civil War happens. The first thing to do, of course, is to define our attackers. In a Peasant Revolt, the attackers are the agents that were placed by the card you played, any pirates that are bordering, in this case there are none, but the color of the pirates wouldn't matter, and your concessions that are bordering. In this case, we are the purple player, so we do have one concession that's bordering, and finally, any repressed pawns on the Empire card, regardless of what color or player they're from, will also engage in the attack. Again, it doesn't matter if the Empire card is in someone's tableau or still on the throne. So in this case, we have an attack of 1, 2, 3, and 4. The defenders will be the knights and the rooks in the Empire. In this case, there's three of them. So we'll do a 1 for 1 damage. These three will be killed and removed from the game to the supply. And we need to take three damage. So we'll go ahead and lose the two pawns of someone else's color and take them off. And then we'll need to lose one of our own. And we'll go ahead and lose the agent that was placed. Are there any attackers remaining? You betcha. There is one of our pawns, our concession, still remaining. So we will get our rewards. The first reward is we can place any of those agents out, but it died during battle. We also have the option to free any repressed pawns from the kingdom, but there are none in this case. We then can free any repressed knights or rooks, but again, there are none in this case. And lastly, we are allowed to play a bonus concession. Again, we have the choice to send them up here where there is a free space, or we could repress the yellow player here by paying one um, florin to the bank, which we will do that, repressing this yellow agent and placing our own concession right there. Because we won the battle, we will now gain this kingdom card. All the same rules apply. If it's in the throne, you gain it, including its queen or any repressed agents that are on it. If it is from an enemy's tableau, you will gain it, but the king, uh, queen will die, any bishop on it will die, but you'll still keep the repressed agents there. And, of course, the enemy uh, tableau will lose any vassals that were on this card. Lastly, if you already had the kingdom card, it again will flip over to its republic side for you. The next cards that we're going to talk about, or the next one-shots, I should say, are the religious wars, crusades, jihads, and reformations. They all work the exact same way. The only difference is which religion is attacking which religion. In this case, crusades will be Catholic forces attacking heretics. If instead it had said jihad, it would be Islamic forces attacking heretics. Heretics are defined as just any other religion. So heretics for the Islam forces would be Catholics or reformists, while 
heretics for the crusaders would be Islam forces or reformist forces. So let's take a look at how one of these battles play out, remembering they all function the same way. So here we will play a crusade card in Mamluk, which of course is located right over here. The first thing that happens when you do a one-shot is again you must place the agents that the card signifies, which in this case are two Catholic Knights. Again, I like to set them right next to the name to know that they are separate, not on the board, not repressed. And now we must define our attackers and defenders. The attackers are of course the agent you played, in this case the Catholic Knights, as well as any other believers in this square. Well, there are no other Catholic forces in the Kingdom of Mamluk, so none there. Also, any believer knights that are adjacent. There's none in Byzantium, there's none in Constantinople, however, there is one Catholic force up here in Hungary. Adjacency counts diagonal. So right now our attackers are two Catholic knights and another Catholic knight. Importantly, it is only believer knights. If there was a believer rook adjacent, they don't get to join in the attack. Rooks are more defensive in this case. And lastly, if there are any believer pirates. If there were any Catholic pirates located adjacent, they would also get to join in the attack. But there are none. Our defenders will be any heretics in the location, which again are just different religions. In this case, there is one Islamic force. It is very important to note that you are not allowed to play any religious war if there are not heretic targets in the kingdom itself. So we have an attack of one, two, and three against the defense of one. So we will deal our damage, killing the rook, killing one unit, we'll choose to kill this one. And now, are there any attacking forces left? You betcha, there are two. So we have won this attack. So we will gain our rewards. The first reward, as always, is you can place any agents that the card gave you in any of the open cities. It's important to note you can never place agents on the broken tokens for the trade fairs. And then you can, of course, free any repressed tokens that are on the kingdom card. And then you will get to place a bonus concession. And we can, of course, place them right there in between these two kingdoms. There aren't any trade routes here. However, there are reasons you might want concessions in between kingdoms that are not trade routes, and we'll talk about that later. And now you will, of course, gain the kingdom card from the throne or from the enemy's tableau, or if it was already in your own, you will flip it to a republic. It is important to note that when you launch a religious war, one other thing happens, and that is the theocracy of the kingdom will change. If it was neutral, it'll change to the new theocracy, and if it was already a theocracy, it'll change to the new theocracy. The game comes with cards of each of the kingdoms that show different theocracy options on them that you can use to show which religion each empire's theocracy is. In this case, we have changed Mamluk from an Islamic theocracy to a Catholic theocracy. So you will take this card and set it down over the empire space, put back the pieces, and now this space counts as a Catholic theocracy. Now that we have gone over all of the one-shots that are explained on the player aids, let's look at all the different operations that the cards have. These are basically actions the cards can take when a player uses the ops of the cards. Again, this helpful player aid explains all of them and goes through what they do, but let's cover them all one by one. The first op to talk about is the Inquisitor op. This op allows you to move a bishop of the related faction. So if you take the ops action on your player board, the tableau ops, and one of your cards has the blue inquisitor ops, you can use this to move one of the matching bishops. In this case, that would be a Catholic bishop. 
So if this is our tableau, we have a bishop right here in England. The inquisitor op that we have right here will let us move the bishop one card to the left or one card to the right. Remembering that the bishop on the card silences the card and effectively stops you from using its ops. The Inquisitor will also let you move the bishop not just left or right, but to anyone's tableau of a matching kingdom. So, if another player had a England card in their tableau, we could use the Inquisitor in order to move this bishop to their tableau, effectively silencing their card. Remember all of the bishop's rules. If the bishop is ever moved to a card that already has a bishop, both bishops will be die and removed from the game. And if a bishop ever moves to a kingdom card, you have the option to kill any one unit that is repressed on that card. Those. Moving on, our next operation that might appear on cards is the commerce op. This op very simply lets you take one florin, one dollar, from either the west or the east market, depending on which card the ops is located. So this is commerce in the west. So if we use that op, we could take one florin from any one card that has florins on it in the west market. The next op is behead. The behead op allows you to kill any one card that is in someone's tableau including your oars if you wanted to. So if you use the behead op, you could kill this card in a player's tableau, this card in a player's tableau. You could even kill someone's king card in their tableau. If the king is ever killed, it is of course taken from the tableau and placed in its throne back on to the main board. Remember, if the king had a queen with him, the queen will be killed in the beheading process. Also remember, if the king had any vassals under them, when they are killed and removed to the main board, the vassals will also be um, killed and removed to the main board. If you ever do use the behead option uh, to kill a king card, the behead card is killed in the process. The next op to talk about is the tax operation. The tax operation, unlike its name, doesn't actually gain you any money, but it allows you to tax another player's concession that is bordering the kingdom the card dictates. So here we have the kingdom of Aragon, and we have a couple different concessions to choose from. And let's say we're purple, so we'll probably choose the uh, yellow pawn here. When you choose a target for the tax action, the yellow player will have a choice. They either have to pay one florin to the bank for a tax, or they have to repress their pawn. Um, if they choose to repress the pawn, it is, of course, taken and put onto the kingdom card, or they will pay the one florin tax to the bank. If the yellow player paid the tax, the yellow player then must add a levy to the city. This requirement means you are not allowed to tax a player if there are no legal placement for levies. So if the yellow player paid their one tax so they wouldn't lose their concession, they would either have to add a Catholic knight or an Islamic rook to this kingdom. And let's see. The next action to talk about is the repress op. op. This op just allows you to repress the agent that it shows. In this case, it shows a pawn. However, it is possible for ops cards to show other symbols like rooks, knights, or even multiple symbols. All you do is you choose one of the agents depicted in this circle that is located in this kingdom, and you immediately repress it. So we could repress any of these pawns located around the kingdom of Aragon. And again, we said we're the purple player, so we will just repress this yellow pawn, putting it onto the kingdom's card as repressed. Another bonus of taking the repress operation is you immediately gain one florin from the bank into your personal tableau. 
The last purple operation we'll talk about is the vote operation. The vote operation allows you to have a vote to see if you can steal a kingdom card from another player. The requirement for voting is that the kingdom card must not be in its throne. The kingdom must be in another player's tableau, even your own. In which case, if you choose to have the vote ops played, you have to look at how many concessions are located around the empire. If you have the majority, you get to gain that kingdom. In this case, we're purple, and we have one, two concessions, and there are no other concessions around, so we will win the vote. So we will be able to take the Aragon Kingdom card from another player's tableau and add it to our own. If for some reason this was already ours, we would flip it, causing it to become a republic. There is a cost to doing this action, and that cost is you must pay one florin for every repressed unit on the kingdom card. Of course, if there are no repressed units on the kingdom card, you won't have to pay any florin. The next op to talk about is the red Cosair op. This op, similar to the bishop op, allows you to move a pirate of the chosen religion, in this case, an Islamic pirate. If we took this op, we can move one Islamic pirate that is adjacent to the kingdom depicted on the card, one space. So here we have an Islamic pirate, and so we can move that pirate following the trade route to over here, or move that pirate following the trade route over here. Wherever the pirate goes, it will immediately kill whichever concession is there. So if we're playing as the purple player, we would move the pirate over here and kill this yellow concession, putting the pirate here instead. There is no cost for playing a Cosair op. The next red op to talk about is the siege op. The siege op very simply just kills one rook, one knight, or one pirate that is in the kingdom's location. So, in the kingdom of the Ottoman Empire, we could kill one rook, one knight, or one pirate. Again, the color doesn't matter. You can just choose one of any of these targets. There is no cost for the siege op. The last op to talk about is the op that the kingdom cards themselves give you, and that is the campaign op. The campaign op is not found on any other cards except for the king card. The king card's campaign allows you to wage war against one of its neighbors. Again, adjacency is diagonal. So if we had the Ottoman king card, we could wage a war against any of the kingdoms located around the Ottoman Empire. The cost of waging a campaign is you must pay one florin to the bank for all of the knights participating in the combat. In this case, there is one knight, so we would pay one florin to the bank. Now you would choose any one of these kingdoms and have a combat. The combat is your knights against their knights and rooks. In this case, 1v1, we would have mutual destruction and we would not be able to conquer the Papal States. Over here, it would be 2v1, we wouldn't win. Over here, 1v1, and up here, 1v1. The only kingdom we can attack and have a victory is the Holy Roman Empire. The same thing happens, just like all the other combats we talked about. You would have one loss for one loss, and then you would gain that kingdom card. Whether it is in the throne on the map, or in another player's tableau. Very importantly, however, you can never wage a campaign against a kingdom you already have. That is the only time you're not allowed to have conflict with yourself. If you did win the campaign, this is the only way for a king card to gain a vassal, and you will put these cards together, remembering the rules of what happens when you lose the head king over the vassals. And that should be everything you need to know to set up and play Pax 
Renaissance. If you have any questions, be sure to consult the rulebook. There is a glossary in the back, as well as a table of contents to all the different actions. If you can't find the answer, feel free to leave me a comment, and I'll try to answer the question as soon as I get a chance. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, be sure to leave me a like and a subscribe. I am thinking about doing a how to play for the solo variant. There is an additional rulebook that explains how to play against the Automa opponent, as well as giving strategic tips to help you learn how to be a better PAX player. Until the next video, thanks for watching.